So uh, this is the uh, basics of foreign exchange called the Forex trading. Now, um, you know, you're just starting out, everything's a little overwhelming, and this uh, video is not to be comprehensive of everything. It's just to kind of give you a, a feel for things that you're going to have to know about, and especially in the beginning, okay? So, you know, there's lots of training uh, with ProAct traders and Forex target trading. But, uh, you know, we want to get a foundation built first. So this is the basics of successful currency trading. There are five characteristics of a good trader. The first one is commitment. You have to commit to the process of becoming a Forex trader. Otherwise, the minute you have your first little setback, you go, okay, this wasn't for me. Well, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh, you know, anything worthwhile is going to take some commitment and endeavor. Discipline. You have to be a disciplined trader. You can't be just shotgunning it and trying to make, oh, check this one. Oh, I think this is going up. I think this is going down. You can't do that kind of stuff. Stewardship. You have to manage your money. Only you are in charge of managing your money. Then we've got continued education, okay? As you begin to learn the Forex, the Forex is a lifelong career uh, move. It's not a, in three weeks I'll get it. You will continue to educate yourself as you go along. And the final thing is patience. The patients waiting for your trade to come to you. Now, a good trader has all five of these things right here, all right? Now, if you've got an area that's a, kind of a weakness for you, then, uh, you know, you need to know what that is and work on it. That brings us to habits. If you always do what you've always done, then you always get what you've always got. So we become experts at what we practice. So it's very, very important that we practice correctly, all right? So there are uh, multiple skills involved with trading, and you can see we have to have market knowledge, all those things there. We have to be able to anticipate our trade. We have to know all those things there. We have to understand our signature trade so we know how we're going to enter this trade and then how we're going to confirm the trade. So there, all these things are pieces, and it all comes down to when you get all this stuff right here, your trading psychology comes into play, and that means you're confident in what you're doing. So what you're about to learn is a learned skill. Now, some people get it faster, but you should get it if you will practice, 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 and you follow the rules. There is no rocket science in the Forex. It's simply a matter of using logic, statistical probability, and having a skill level based on chart analysis to enable you to figure the market out. So let's lay the foundation here, all right? So the Forex market on average has a daily volume of about $3.9 trillion per day, making it 150 times larger than the New York Stock Exchange. Now, the market is moved by the big boys. These are bankers, hedge funds, and big corporations. Now, if you want to trade with the big boys, you have to learn how they think and, most importantly, how they will react. This is UBS Warburg's trading floor in Stamford, Connecticut. There are 1,300 traders on the floor. And this is who you're trading against, professional traders, right? So that tells you that uh, you have to have some skill. And uh, we start with the basics to get our skill level. The first thing we have to know is, when do we trade? I understand it's a 24-hour day market. Does that mean we trade all 24 hours? And the answer to that is no. The Japanese market opens at 7 p.m. New York time and goes to 4 a.m. London opens 3 a.m. in the morning New York time and goes till noon. The United States market opens at 9 a.m. and goes till 4. But the reality about the USA market is called the New York session. It usually doesn't uh, even start till about 9.30 because typically traders wait for the stock market to open. But it's the overlap periods where you have the most opportunity for trades, okay? So when you have both the, the yen and the London open right in this area right here, then there's a lot of uh, potential volatility. When the London and the USA market is open, we have a lot of volatility. So that helps move the market. So we want to only be trading two to two and a half hours at a time in any session. All right? You could trade multiple sessions a day, but no longer than two to two and a half hours on each session. Now, we always enter trades in the momentum periods. That's that first two, two and a half hours of the session. But we can manage our trades that are on during the off times. Now, this is a... Uh, a, a um, 
slide showing you the distribution of currency pairs. And you can see that the vast majority of trades are made in the euro US dollars. 28% of all the trades are made in the US dollar. The dollar yen is 14%. The pound yen is 9%. The rest of them over here on the left take up 3 to 5 for 6% right there. And others would be, you know, the South African RAN, uh, you know, the Chinese yuan, you know, things like that. Other uh, currencies that are not typically over the counter traded, all right? So we measure our profit in pips. What is a pip? If you come from the stock market, you're used to points. In, uh, in our market, in the Forex, we're called pips, all right? Because we're an older market than the Forex, or, I mean, than the stock market. The uh, foreign exchange has been going on for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And a pip is actually one point on a dice. All right. So as it has matured over the thousands of years, we end up showing uh, we end up showing uh, prices here, uh, which have decimal points. Okay. So for instance, on this dollar yen, all right, it's 77.955, and that's fractional pricing, which means it's actually 77.95.5, half of a pip right there. So when the currency would move up from 77.955. To 77.965, it will have moved one pip, all right? So, a pip has different values. Each currency may have a different value based on the relative worth of its counterpart. Now, in a standard account, typically a pip is worth ten dollars a, a, a pip. In a mini account, where you're trading only a dollar, it's worth a dollar a pip. And in a micro account, it's worth ten cents. Okay. And you can buy multiple lots or just one in each of the accounts above. Now, your broker will collateralize this based on your deposit and what size account you are trading, okay? So, uh, in a standard account, we, uh, we have $1,000 in there, okay? In a mini account, it's $100. And in a micro account, it's $10, okay? So, if you want to trade a, a micro, if you have a, you know, $500 in your account, uh, you could trade a mini account or a micro account because you have $500. The broker will sequester $100 when you when you make a trade if you're in a mini and you still have $400 left. You could obviously see you couldn't do that in a standard account because the broker's going to need $1,000 worth of collateral to trade that, and you've only got $500 there. See, so the more lots you trade, the more collateral your broker will require of your account. Right? So a lot is what we use as a unit of measurement. A unit, a one micro is a micro lot. One mini is a mini lot. A standard account is a standard lot. Okay, that's what they're called. Now in the U.S. dollar, in the U.S. in the U.S. jurisdiction, we have 50 to one uh, leverage, but outside the U.S. we can have 100 to 400 to one. So what does that mean? Okay, let's use 100 to one as an example. Okay, so you know if we want to trade, um, you know if we have ten thousand dollars in our account and we want to trade a standard account, the broker will hold one thousand dollars. Okay, and we will and he will let us trade a hundred thousand dollars. All right. In other words, by holding by holding his collateral for your collateral at a thousand dollars, he's going to lend you ninety nine thousand dollars. Okay, and if you're in the United States, he won't lend you a hundred thousand dollars. He'll only lend you fifty thousand dollars, or actually forty nine thousand. You have a thousand in collateral. All right. So how does this work? This is a broker station, and I've just blown this up over here. And you can quickly see this is where the the price to sell the currency is here. And the price to buy a currency is over here. So they quote them simultaneously. So if you want to sell the euro dollar, you this is the price to sell it. But if you want to buy the euro dollar, this is the price to buy it. Okay. So a pip is the smallest unit of movement that a currency lot can make. All right. So we see here in this euro US dollar, it's 57.69. If the currency moves up to 1.5770, it has moved one pip. Or one decimal point. All right. Down here in the dollar yen, it only has two decimal points. So here it's a 162.85. If it moves from 162.85 to 162.84, then it would have moved one decimal point or one pip. Now, fractional pricing looks a little bit different. All right. It looks like this. 
I've blown it up here. And you see, uh, it means that the spread can change with liquidity, all right? So, uh, you know, you can see right there the British pound is 1.6279, and then it should be a 0.6 there. Or in the case of the of the buy, the ask right here, it should be, it's 1.62 down here, 1.6283.2, or two-tenths of a pip is is on here and this could go all the way up to nine and down now in times of high volatility though if you're using fractional that means they do not have fixed spreads and that means that uh, the market is going to fluctuate based on the volatility and it could jump as high as 20 pips now it's important to understand you are borrowing one currency and paying for it with another at the end of your trade if you make money you pay back your loan and then have an increase in your margin with the profit you made. But if not, you pay back the loan still. In this case, you pay it back with your margin. That's the reason the broker is holding collateral. Right? So prices are always priced in dollars, okay? So these are called the four majors, the U.S. dollar yen, the euro U.S. dollar, the British pound U.S. dollar, and the U.S. dollar Swiss franc. There are 17 crosses available, and actually there are more than that, all right? So this is called the base currency. That's the currency that you're going to see the chart moving on. That's what the candlesticks are. They're telling you what the U.S. dollar is doing or the British pound or the euro in this cross. Okay. But the second part is what you're going to buy or sell the cross with. So in the case of the British pound U.S. dollar, if you wanted to buy it, you would be buying it with U.S. dollars and you would be buying British pounds with U.S. dollars. And the conversion has to be made behind the scenes by the broker. He does all that. All right now there's still a spread there the sell and the buy or the bid and the ask who gets the difference the broker does he gets the difference for providing you a place to do that and also for lending you the money up front with your small amount of collateral that's what he gets his, his payment for but he takes his money right away so there is no commission there is no interest that kind of thing but there is the spread so the, then the question becomes, will I get the price quoted on the chart? Well, remember, the broker is always quoting the bid and the ask, okay? And there's a spread difference. So if the actual price right now, using this hypothetical example, was 1.9647, that's the real price, the broker has got to quote a price of an ask for those who want to buy it above that level, and he has to simultaneously quote a price below that level, uh, for the sellers, all right. So it, the chances of you getting the actual price on the chart is very uh, is you know slim to none, all right, because of the difference in the bid and the ask. Okay. So for an example here, this British pound, all right. So they're quoting right here. There's a 96.47 is the exact price, and you can see the bid and the ask here. He's quoting if you want to sell it 96.45, but if you want to buy it, it's 96.49. All right. You can see it's just splitting the difference. The actual price of the currency right now is 47, right? And the difference between this price and this price is the broker spread. Now the forex broker gives us the right to trade long. We can enter the market buying, and then we would exit the market selling our lots. Now we're pretty used to that because if you buy something and you sell it later, you get that you understand that. Oh, I bought a car last year, and now I'm selling it. Okay, so we understand that. That's called going long. But we can also go short in the forex, which means we enter the market selling, and we exit the market buying our lots back out. All right. So you need to understand those terms. All right. So let me give you an example of how this works. Now in the stock market, I'm going to use a U.S. company called Walmart. If we decided that Walmart was going to do this pretty well this year, we would go buy Walmart and we would hope to profit as the price or the value of the stock increased in value. Right? It went up. But that's not what we do in the, in the Forex because in the Forex we're trading one currency against the other. To use that same example, here are two competitors. Target and Walmart. And let's say we own Target because we have, and that equals the U.S. dollars in this example. Okay, we own Target and we decide, you know what, Walmart is going to go up in price. So what would we do? We would buy Walmart with our Target shares, all right? And if it went up, we would do fine. Now, by default, Target would be going down if Walmart is going up just the opposite in a short okay we own target and we want to we we think walmart's going to go down in price so what do we do we short walmart and by default the value of target goes up because we already own that 
right? And remember, in, in, uh, in uh, the currency, this, this Walmart would represent, let's say, the British pound, and Target represents U.S. dollars. Well, U.S. dollars are what you own and you have in the broker's uh, account. You have them in there in his account in dollars. So you already own Target automatically just because you have an account open, see? That's to give you an example that most people can kind of wrap their head around. So the process is both the buyer and the seller have deposited funds with the broker. They both decide to place an order. One of them is a bull and one of them is a bear. One thinks the market's going up, the other thinks it's going down. That's why we have a market. They both place orders with the broker. Now you and I don't have a, uh, a, re a racial relationship with the interbank currency market, but the broker does. So he brokers our trades, buyer or lessu, he doesn't care what you do, buy or sell, and he brokers it to the interbank currency market. All right? For that, he earns a spread. Now, technical traders learn to read charts. Successful technical traders read charts just like a doctor reads an x-ray. Right? So charts are always telling a story. Charts tell traders where the market is trying to go. Right? So we must understand how Japanese candlesticks work then. That's what we show in the charts. All right? So a bull candle is when the market opened here. Oh, sorry. Kind of messed that up, didn't I? Here we go. The market opened right here, and then it had a little movement to the downside. And as it came back through its opening, it becomes a bull candle, a green candle. And it works its way up, goes as high as this, and then there's some selling take place, and it closes above its opening. That's a bull candle. All right? Now, in a, um, a bear candle, it's just the opposite. The market opens here goes up a little bit and then as it passes through its opening it becomes a bear candle or a red candle and it goes all the way down here and then some selling uh, subsides and it closes below its opening that's called a bear candle and it, every time frame is different so when you look at a 60 minute chart this candlestick represents 60 minutes of time if you're looking at a five minute chart this candlestick represents five minute, minutes of time and essentially you're looking at a visual representation of an auction for money, right? So there are several ones that we got to pay attention to. One's called an engulfing candle, doji star, independent candle, also called tweezers, sisters, and twins, and exhaustion candles. And closing and opening a candlestick can be a big deal in the forex, right? So an engulfing candle is one that follows a previous candle of the opposite color. So you can see a green candle means they were buying the currency, and then all of a sudden this big red one comes in, which means they sold the currency. That's what it's telling you. Very simple, right? So let's take a look at it in the real world. This is a chart with candlesticks on it. I've blown this circle thing up big so you can see it. Can we see the engulfing candles as the bears are rapidly taking over the market? That's what's happening. The doji star signifies an indecision or a turning point. Okay, So a doji means that the candlestick opened here, went all the way down to here, went all the way up to here, and closed exactly at its opening. Therefore, it is, not, it is undecided whether it's a bull candle or a bear candle, and it's a potential turning point. So here's one right here. You can see it right in here. And they're very significant at the end of a run. So we've been buying up here, and all of a sudden, there's a doji, right? Indecision, right? So I made it big here so you can see it, right? The market was green here. Then the doji says, I don't know. Maybe we're going up. Maybe we're going down. And then somebody makes a decision, and all of a sudden, we see red candles coming in as the sell-off takes up place. Exhaustion candles signify a turning point also, and they're found on the 60-minute chart for best results. But let's take a look at this very carefully here. So the market opened down here and went all the way up here and then came all the way down here and it closed above its opening. But this is called an exhaustion candle. Huge wick up here. So what happened? They got up to a certain price point and massive selling took place inside the candle. The reality is it's still going to close above its open. Therefore, it will end up being a green candle or a bull candle, but it's telling you something totally different. Massive selling was taking place. 
Conversely, in a red candle that's got an exhaustion wick, the exact opposite was taking place. The candle went all the way down here. It was a full candle all the way down the end of the wick. And then massive buying took place. By the time the candlestick closed, it closed below its opening, so it's going to become a bare candle. But it's not telling you it's a bare candle. It's telling you we're going the other way. So here's one right here. You can see this. All right, this big exhaustion wick. It's a green candle, yes. But what does it mean? It means that massive selling took place there. Let's take a look at twins. All right, Ooh, back to here. Twins are caused by institutional selling. So the market was going down, they find their price, and instantly they close their buy, their sells and enter their buys, and up they go. They come up here in a buy, and they instantly get rid of their buys and instantly enter their sells. They're called twins, sisters, railroad tracks, lots of different names. And they occur in the marketplace all the time, and they always signify a potential turning place in the market. So I've blown this up right here so you can see it, all right? And there it is, and boom. Look what the market did from there. So let's look at a run and see if the candles were talking to us. All right, so here we go. We can see we've been coming down. We can tell because the moving averages are headed down. And it all starts with this set of twins right here as the market reversed. Then the market goes up. It's telling you we're going to go up. And then right up in here, what do we get? We get a doji indecision and a little bit of sell-off. And then another set of twins says we're going to continue this move to the upside. We come up here to the top. We get an exhaustion wick. Okay, so it, up it goes. And a massive selling takes place inside that candle. All right. Then we get an engulfing candle to the downside. But guess what? This is a pretty long run, and the big boys can't get rid of all their cells at one time when there's a long run because they have too many to get rid of. And so they take it back up again one more time, and they have another set of twins, and that's where the actual selling takes place for the last of the, of the, of the uh, lots that they own. And that's why we get twins and, tri and triplets and double tops and triple tops, those kind of things. And then the market reverses. So Proact Charts uh, software is your tool to reading charts. And there are complete tutorials on how to use the Proact Charts at ProactTraders.com. And you will use, the, as you use the tools, they'll become very clear how to use those. And make sure you attend our live beginners classes to see how to put it all together. Now let's talk a little bit about inverse relationships. Okay, so here we have a, a crop. The euro dollar going up, and over here we have the U.S. dollar, Swissy, going down. All right. Now up here you see that the euro is the is the base currency, and we're going to buy that currency, the euro, with dollars. Euro dollar. And so this is the movement of the euro against the dollar. So remember, if the euro is going up, then by default the dollar has to be going down. So this one over here is the U.S. dollar is the base currency, and we're going to sell the U.S. dollar with Swiss francs. And so by default, it needs to be going down also. It's called an inverse relationship. All right, so the euro and the British pound typically go opposite of the U.S. dollar Swissy and the U.S. dollar yen. All right, so if you're going to trade one or the other, it's fine, but don't trade them both. All right. Now, what about the dollar CAD? That's got a dollar in it, but it could do anything. Why could it do anything? Because oil affects that currency. Now, the Forex trends, and it's one of the keys to success in the Forex, but trends are found only on a 240 minute or higher chart. Right? So when you get a, up on a 240 chart, and we can see we're in a downtrend, we're going to look for sells, or we're going to short in a downtrend, looking for that opportunity. In an uptrend, we're going to look for buys or to go long in an uptrend. Sustainable trends are 45 degrees. So a downtrend is 45 degrees down or an uptrend 45 degrees. Anything greater than that is not a sustainable trend. But the market also ranges, and that is 70% of the time. So you can see here, the market's going sideways. The market's going sideways. And that's an area we call the desert. Inside the lowest moving average and the highest moving average. And trades out of the desert are more safe than trades in because, as you can see, they have a tendency to range inside there. All right. So this requires patience, discipline, and different trade sets up, setups to be profitable. All right. Trends and ranging efforts are, are efforts to achieve a target, and there is always a target. And knowing the target and then your risk equals a tradable setup. And the minimum you can accept is one to one. 
All right, so let's take a look at a chart here. And these yellow lines indicate where your stop will be if you're going to make a trade. So we get our first opportunity to trade right here. All right, with this arrow and painted candle as money comes in. And we know where the target is, right down here. That's why there's always a target. All right, see that? Now my stop is going to have to be, if I trade this one right here, this arrow and painted candle right here, and my stop's going to have to be above this yellow line. That's my risk that's my reward and we can see that it's a good risk to reward better than one to one all right now i get another opportunity as i break this one right here this uh, this support and i'm now looking for this target right down here all right my stop will have to be above here so there's my risk there's my reward all right so we can see that that would be a great opportunity right there all right, now what about this one right here? Could we take this one? It's an arrow and a painted candle telling us money's coming in, and the answer is no, we can't take that because we're too close to the target. Our risk will have to be above this line, but our target is a very small amount right down here. See that? All right, but the market also reverses. Now, new traders should never attempt a reversal, all right? But they happen quite often right there. So we look for buying opportunities when we're going long, and once we break out, not until we break out of this uptrend, then we begin to look for sell opportunities to the downside. There's the key. When it breaks out of the trend right there, that's when we can now become a seller where before we were a buyer. That would be the new trend. So looking for shorts. All right, so then once we figure that out on a bigger chart, then we look for opportunities on a 10-minute chart. There's an opportunity. There's an opportunity. There's another one where the white dot shows up, okay? There's an opportunity down here. These are opportunities as long as we know where the targets are to enter trades. Pretty simple to see. So where do I start? You first familiarize yourself with your broker's platform. It is a free demo, and you can practice your skill at pricing trades. Right? The learn, then you learn to put trends on your charts. Next, you learn to put the HSI targets on a chart. That is your exit if you have room. Now, you really learn the RF1010 trade setup. That is your entry. Practice making a good math decision based on a one-to-one -one reward for the risk. 22 pip stop must have a 22 pip target or you can't make the trade. Refrain from clicking trades out for 5 to 8 pips. This is a bad habit to start and it's very hard to break it. You will need to know more than this, but this will get you started. Right? There are six free live lessons for beginners on the beginners page of the website and you can join us every week and ask questions and there is no charge for that. Please do not use live money until you have mastered the basics. When you do go live, start with micros, not minis or standards. Practice, practice, practice. Learn to paper trade. There's a, a, a tutorial on how to paper trade up on our website also. Enjoy your new journey in the Forex. Read this book before going live, The Disciplined Trader by Mark D Douglas. Be sure and familiarize yourself with your dealing station ba basics and Every single broker has a tutorial and all will give you a one-on-one -on -one class if you ask. So if you're ready to start, go to, uh, to ProactTraders.com. Thank you.